I recently received a request to work a two degree of freedom problem that involved both translation and rotation. So I thought a fairly useful example would be that of a car, could be otherwise a bicycle or a lathe. Most of them would use the same analysis. And the idea is we can approximate the car as a mass, which I've drawn as and the type of elasticity, which we'll call K1 and K2 respectively. I've also drawn the center of gravity. It's just an approximation. The distance from the center of gravity to the front wheel is L1, and the distance to the back wheel from the center of gravity is L2. And the car has some mass m and some mass j gravity. As a periodic force, could be thought of as perhaps the engine which is uh, moving has some sort of an imbalance. So you could have a force which was something like f of t is equal to f sub zero times sine of omega t. Something like that. Not important for the purpose of this problem. Perhaps where there's some sort of a, a elastic connection between the supports and the ground, and we'll proceed using Lagrange's equations to try to find the equations of motion. So the starting point, as always, is to find the kinetic energy, which we'll call T. Kinetic energy for this is very easily written. It's just one half times m. Oh, I must talk about coordinates. I've gone ahead and uh, called x x in the downward direction, the displacement of the center of gravity. Um, I come from an aerospace background. We typically call this a plunging motion down. And while it's bouncing or plunging, it's also pitching. So this car is, let me draw it here, it's bouncing up and down. And at the same time, it's rotating. We call this pitching. So we've defined the pitching as an angle theta, which is positive in the clockwise direction. And again, x is positive downwards, and it's the location of the center of gravity. Uh, it's probably useful to mention that I could have chosen other coordinates, right? I could have said, oh, we will call this, let me just do it in red, uh, we'll call this x1 and x2, which is the displacement of uh, the mass above each of the wheels. Or I could have said, let's just call this x over here and theta, it's fairly arbitrary. Uh, based on the coordinates that you choose, you might find different coupling. Because we can write the velocity of this mass, the, the, the rotational velocity is just theta dot, and the pitch plunge velocity is just x dot, we should expect, since there's no coupling in the velocity, that we should have a diagonal mass matrix. On the other hand, since the displacement of the springs involve both x and theta, we should expect that there will be coupling in the stiffness matrix. So the stiffness matrix will not be diagonal. So the kinetic energy can be written as t equals one half times m x dot, whoops, change pens, x dot squared plus one half j sub zero dot squared. Very simple. Now the potential of a speed can be written as one half times k1 times the displacement of k1. Well, the displacement of k1 can be written as x minus l1 theta quantity squared. And why is it minus? Because the displacement x and the displacement due to theta are in opposite directions. All right, and now the effect of K2 is just one half K2 times X. In this case, it's plus L2 theta quantity squared. Now, the Lagrangian can be written L equals T minus V. We'll call that equation three. And now we'll write out Lagrange's equations. I'll use a different color here just to keep it separate. Uh, Lagrange's equations. Better than that. Okay. 
and that says that the time derivative of partial L partial Q dot sub I minus partial L partial Q sub I is equal to the generalized force, capital Q sub I, and we'll call this equation 4. Okay, so we will substitute equations 1 and 2 into equation 3 to get the Lagrangian, and then equation 3 is substituted into equa equation 4. Let me write that out. So 1 and 2 get substituted into 3, which in turn gets substituted into 4. And then if I take the derivative with respect to each of the generalized coordinates, let's start off with x, so we can get the equation of motion in the x direction. We end up with the derivative of t with respect to x dot. Well, it's only the first term. So that's mx double dot, since the second term is not a function of x dot. And the derivative, the negative derivative well, it's two negatives, right? Negative v, and we're taking the negative of that. So it's actually just the positive derivative of v with respect to x. And that is plus k1 x minus l1 theta, since the two cancels with the half, plus k2 times x plus l2 theta. And that is equal to f of t. I'm just going to call it f. I've dropped the t dependency. It should be implied that x and theta and f are all functions of time. Just for shorthand, I'm going to leave that. Um, I'm going to write it in a slightly different form. mx double dot plus k1 plus k2 times x plus k2 l2 minus k1 l1 theta equals f. That's our first equation of motion. We'll call that equation number five. In order to find the equation of motion for the theta direction, uh, we do the exact same thing, but we use theta as our generalized coordinate, uh, taking the derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to theta dot gives us j sub zero theta double dot taking the, uh, the derivative of the potential with respect to theta, we get uh, plus, let's see how I want to write this, uh, k1 well, should be a minus, uh, k1 l1 times x minus l1 theta. That's because the derivative the twos cancel the half, and the derivative of this is just minus L1, which is why I've taken it out in front. Okay, plus K2 L2 times X plus L2 theta. And that is equal to the moment produced by this force. The moment is in the negative theta direction, so it should have a negative sign, uh, negative F, times the moment arm, which is L1. Okay, and I'm going to choose to rewrite this as J sub 0 theta double dot plus uh, K2 L2 minus K1 L1 times X plus K1, the minuses cancel, so it's K1 L1 squared plus k2 l2 squared times theta is equal to minus f times l1. And we'll call that equation 6. And then finally, I'm just going to write 5 and 6 in matrix form, since that's how we like to write these things. Um, makes it more convenient. This implies the mass matrix looks like m0, 0, j sub 0, times x double dot, theta double dot, plus the mass matrix is k1 plus k2, 
and K2 L2 minus K1 L1. Uh, same thing here, K2 L2 minus K1 L1. Of course, this should always be symmetric. If it isn't, you've done something wrong. And then is K1 L1 squared plus K2 L2 squared. And that's times X and theta. And that equals F minus F L1. And there you have it. These are the equations of motion and bouncing. Uh, again, you can use these same, the same analysis for a lathe or for a bicycle or a motorcycle. Um, and I think that's all I want to say at this point about this video. Again, I remind you that it's determined, your, your, your choice of coordinates determines what your matrices look like. Um, you could get coupling in your mass matrix if we chose our coordinates to be different. For instance, if we had x1 and x2 here, that would have produced coupling, a dynamic coupling. Anyway, I hope you found something useful in this video. If you did, please go ahead and give us a thumbs up. Um, I'd love to hear your comments in the section below. Or better still, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to the channel and you'll be notified as new videos are released. Thank you for watching. We'll catch up with you in the next video.